thank you so much for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, and also following Danielle is always, well, intimidating, but fun. Uh, so that's great. Um, so first, before I start, I just want to kind of uh, acknowledge I've been doing this uh, for the past nine months. We are in the middle of COVID. Uh, we are in the middle of a pandemic. Things are not normal and uh, everything is more difficult. So if, uh, if you're wondering, especially, you know, for, for younger researchers, if you're wondering whether you're, you're not doing well, you are doing great. We're all struggling. Okay, so that being said, um, I want to reflect a little bit on uh, the topic of this workshop. So I'm going to take a, a slightly different approach from uh, what Daniela uh, did. And I just wanted to note that um, I think in her talk, and especially when you think about autonomous driving, the notion of safe has a very specific meaning, right? Don't kill anyone. Don't drive off the road. So the notion of safety is very clear. But what I want to talk about today is to, to mainly um, examine whether safety is always that, right? Is it always don't kill someone. All right, so this is from the abstract of the talk. Uh, I, sorry, not the abstract of the talk, the abstract of the workshop. So this is uh, 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 repurposing uh, Garen Claire's talk, uh, words, I would imagine. And a few things I wanted to highlight here are words that are, have safety, the people who would use it, interaction and collaboration. So those are kind of the things that I think about in terms of what I want autonomy to do. Then there's, there's these words. It's impossible to guarantee at all times, not easy to understand, brittle to false, designed in, in isolation. So that, that's kind of highlighting the, the problems that we have right now. And I know this, this workshop was set up, especially the introduction, was set up towards learning-based systems, but I'm gonna talk about it a little more broadly, uh, not necessarily just for learning. Although a lot of these things do come up, uh, can be mitigated, but also exasperated using learning systems. So the things I want to kind of explore or kind of reflect on here are the questions of specifications and feedback and how does that does that tie into autonomy. Uh, where specificate, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, a bit more about that. Um, really what I want to do is I want to show um, kind of my current thinking about specifications and feedback and how we can utilize those for, for autonomy. I'm going to show you a few examples of different types of the specifications, different types of feedback from different systems my group has done. And I'm going to have I'm going to shamelessly plug two papers that are more overview papers that I think uh, are relevant. Um, so, uh, excuse me for that. All right. When I think about specifications, um, and when I think about safety, when I think about certification guarantees, I think about typically either verification or synthesis. So, how does it play? How, how does it uh, come into play? And I, I know a lot of you know this already, but the way I want to think about this is I have a system, I have autonomy, and I have a set of, of specifications. I want I have some things that I want the, the autonomy to do or properties I want the, the autonomy to have. And then I have uh, verification algorithms that would check whether that specification or whether the autonomy satisfies the specifications. That's not always the case. It's not always the case that verification tells you yes. Um, so then there's the, the, if, if, um, if verification fails, typically the type of feedback you would get is some notion of counterexample. Here's an example where the specification does not hold in this, um, uh, in this situation for this autonomy for the specification. So that's kind of one, one view of specifications and systems. The dual view of that, and this is kind of where my work typically sits, is in synthesis, where we have some notion of abstractions. We have some pieces, some building blocks they can compose together. I have specifications, and typically I have a user that might not be an expert in, this, uh, in the system. And then synthesis, what it does, it takes the abstractions and compose them in a, composes them in a way that guarantees specifications are guarantees specifications hold. So there's no need of, for a verification step because we have kind of this correct by construction approach. Now it's not this, it's the same way as, as verification. It's not necessarily the case that we can we can always find a design. So then we have feedback, and the notion here in feed, of feedback can be. I don't know if it can be richer, but the way we've been thinking about this is there are kind of three ways you can provide feedback. You can either uh, basically tell the user, can't do this because blah, blah, blah. You might be able to automatically change the specifications. Now, whether you want to do that or not, that's a different question, but there are ways and there are different, uh, uh, there's a lot of work out there on uh, automatically changing specifications such that they're close and satisfiable, but not exactly what you had before. And then there's also the question of, can I use the feedback to identify abstractions that are flawed or even maybe fix them? And I'll, 
I'm going to allude to that a little bit, but that's kind of the hardest problem, right? So that's kind of the the the, the least read uh, uh, arrow that I have there. So what I want to do now, I want to give you a couple of examples of uh, what I mean by specifications, what I mean by abstractions, what I mean by synthesis and feedback. And the, the main point of showing these different um, projects that we've had in the past is to show, sorry, I didn't mean to do that yet, um, is to show the breadth of what specifications can be. So it can be beyond safety. It doesn't have to be, let me not kill someone, let me not crash into something. It could be also things that we would like the system to do. Okay, so I guess in the, in the context of autonomous driving, yes, you want to reach a destination. But people, when people, when typically when people think, think about safety for for self-driving cars, is you know the the safety aspect of it, as opposed to the liveness. All right, so let me talk a, uh, about a couple of different um, systems that we've looked in the past. The first thing I want to show, this is a collaboration with, uh, now it's done, um, with Mark Campbell at Cornell and, and uh, Mark Yim at Penn. These are modular robots. These are, in this case, these are the s'mores. Uh, those are de designed by, by uh, Mark Yim's group at, at, at Penn. And these are uh, 10 by 10 by 10 cubes that have four degrees of freedom. So it has two wheels, a uh, pan on the top and then a tilt. It kind of can, can uh, bend in the middle. And you can connect them, connect these modular robots using uh, electropermanent permanent magnets. So on the sides, you can see these crescents, these dark crescents. These are electropermanent magnets that you can turn on and off. So the nice thing about this is you can self reconfigure. So you can do things autonomously. So what are, what are the specifications here? What, what, what are we thinking about here? So here's it's not so much the notion of safety of don't crash, but rather, you know, it could be have to do, in this case, uh, my specifications have to do with, with shape because I can change it. It has to do with motion because I'm moving around the environment and so on. So uh, that project was on high level uh, behaviors for modular robots. So the idea is to create, autonomously create behaviors for robots or autonomously create um, modular robots that um, perform some high level task, but also may change their shape based on set, ta set task. So the abstractions here were uh, sensors that we had on, on the system, you'll see in a second, and um, a library of configurations and gates that, that uh, govern the, the morphology of the robot, what's connected to what, but also the gates. How do, how, what, is the, what are the controls that cause the robot to move in a certain way? The specifications or abstractions over the sensors and the, the properties of, uh, of the gates and the configuration of gates. And then we could, what we did is we wrote um, specifications using linear temporal logic. I'll talk about uh, LTL in a second, in a little bit. Uh, and then I can start writing specifications such as always, which has a, a kind of a, uh, the way it, it sounds like a safety specification, right? The safety always has to hold. If you see stairs, I want you to use a, um, a configuration gate that can climb. If you see pink, I want you to pick up an object. Okay, so we're abstract. I mean, the sense sensing here is totally abstracted away um, uh, for, for objects. So, you know, uh, just basically color here. Uh, but the environment is based on sensor information. So detecting stairs is based on, um, on the perception algorithm. So then I can run this and I can get feedback now, not just on uh, the task can or cannot be done, or, or just on the logical um, on whether the, the, the logic that we wrote is satisfiable, but we can also start uh, giving feedback on possible problems that we might have that have to do with the physics, or with, the, with, the, with the configurations and gates that we have and possibly conflicting behaviors, right? So one type of, of feedback I could give is um, you're asking me to do two things that are inconsistent. That's at the logical level. But here we can say, you know what, if you see stairs in pink, you need a configuration gate that can both climb and pick up an object, but that does not exist in the library. So that kind of feedback is, is a way of, and I, I realize that for, uh, you know, in a control theoretic uh, um, audience, uh, feedback is a very overloaded word. So I should have kind of clarified that uh, to start out with. But what I mean by feedback is kind of information that can help you fix the system in this case. So here, basically, the system can come and say, well, I'm missing this kind of configuration gate. Can you generate that? If you can generate that, great, I can guarantee the behavior. And then what this allows us to do is to write a specification that is slightly more complex than what you're seeing now, but not by a lot. 
and then run the exact same specification with the exact same uh, library of configuration, configurations and gates and get two different behaviors. So this is uh, one, this is the other, it's the exact same behavior. So if you see stairs climb, if you see something high, high up, reach it, reach it high up. If you see something pink, drop whatever you're holding. So these are the, again, exact same, exact same specification, exact same building blocks, the, the library of configurations and gates, um, but very, very different behaviors because of the environment in which it's moving, because of what it's perceiving at runtime. In this case, on the left, it sees the stairs. On the right, it sees kind of something to put on top. Uh, and this is fully autonomous. So this is write a specification, hit enter, let the thing go. Right, so again, times eight, it's slow. <laughs> and uh, uh, this was not the only take. There were takes that failed uh, for many reasons because we are dealing with hardware. But really what I'm trying to show here is that um, these specifications, the ability to articulate ahead of time what I want the system to do and the ability to transform that into um, auto automatically into in this case shape and and uh, and control um, is very is very powerful in the ability to provide um, uh, analysis of how this will, will behave. That was one type. This is when when we're dealing with hardware. What happens? If, this is another example. This is another uh, collaboration that's uh, that's now done. Um, specifically, this was with uh, Tom Howard, who was at uh, University of Rochester. And here the idea, this was from natural language. Um, we have a Baxter. So uh, the, the abstraction is basically the motions that the Baxter can, can, can do. And then we can write a specification such as pick up the blue block, drop it on, on your right, pick up the red block, drop it on your left. So this is what I want the robot to do. This is my specifications. You can tell there's nothing, there's no safeties here. It's, it's, it's mainly a bunch of livenesses. It's a bunch of things I want to happen. It could be in the uh, in this case. I could also specify don't knock the the bin off the table, um, but it wasn't not, not in this case. The types of feedback I can give in this kind of situation is, for example, if the, the, there were no red blocks on the table, I can say what we're able to automatically generate because of the, we have the specifications because because we are perceiving the environment. We can see that there's some discrepancy between things that we're assuming or think that the system, might, the, the user might assume and what is actually in practice. So for example, if I'm asking you to pick up the red block, um, if there is no red block, what, what is the intention? Is the intention that there would be a red block? Is the intention that, you know, it's, it's a, and there's some subtleties in, in terms of how we model this in the logic, but really what it allows us to do is to allow us to provide this kind of feedback. I assume, I'm assuming there should be a red block. There should be a red block there. Is that the case? If not, I cannot pick it up. And so on. Then we can also kind of um, generate uh, control that automatically does this. And I'll, I'll come back to this video in, in, in a little bit. The final thing I wanted to show in terms of kind of uh, past work that that uh, um, my group has done, this is kind of more recent work. And, I, and this is kind of the slide that you cannot follow because I did not give you enough context. So sorry, but I like kind of the picture. Um, the idea now is if I'm trying to synthesize, I have a sort of abstraction, I have, um, uh, a temporal logic formula, and I'm trying to synthesize a controller. I'm trying to satisfy the system, and I can't. There's something that will, will, will not let me synthesize. What I can do, and this is kind of an ongoing, ongoing work that I'm really excited about, is that um, I can take information from, what, or from the structure of the problem, from, the, from trying to synthesize. I can extract information that will enable me to, to figure out um, what skill I'm missing to satisfy the task. So let's say I have a bunch of things that the robot can do. And now I want to compose these things through some high levels. I write some high level specification and I want to compose everything together. And then, um, but I realize I can't find, I, I can't do it. There's a reason I can't do it. Or maybe there's another safety that I was added or, or, or something like that. Can I use um, the, the specification itself and the, the process of synthesizing to figure out, had I had this skill, if I had this type of behavior, then I would be able to do it. So at the symbolic level, we know how to do that. Um, what we're working on right now, and this is kind of a, a current, uh, current work, is I can have, there might be multiple skills that will solve this task. And this is at the symbolic level. How do I go from the symbolic level 
to an actual physical motion of the robot in a way that's uh, best. Now, what best is, that is something that we're starting to have, trying to wrap our heads around, right? Is it the, the, that the minimum change from a current skill? Is it uh, the, the easiest it is? So minimum, uh, some minimizing something. So those are kind of, and that's kind of where learning really would come into play because um, uh, I know what I want to get. I know what the parameters are around it. I might have some constraints. So I think some people will be, hopefully will be talking about, I think Peter's talking to, tomorrow about uh, uh, kind of this notion of, of reinforcement learning with safety or, and, you know, and Claire's not giving a talk, but you know, it <laughs> definitely falls into to other, you know, a lot of really cool work of that the people on the call. Um, so yeah, so using this feedback to figure out the missing skill to enable me to solve, to, to fix a much more complicated skill, a much more complex skill. So those are kind of the things uh, that we've been thinking about. I keep talking about these properties. I keep saying, saying safety and liveness and, and the, the title of the, the workshop is safe autonomy, but I'm gonna take the safe, the word safe, to mean something broader than nothing bad will happen. So if we think about this and, and, and uh, uh, within kind of the formal methods, um, even in cyber, cyber physical system kind of world, um, there's a lot of just conversations about um, what specifications and different types of specifications. And I'm, 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 there's more nuance here for sure, but these are kind of the things I, I, I think about when I think about specifications in the context of autonomy. Is safety, something bad will not happen sometimes, uh, or something good will always happen. So the notion of never or always, uh, and we think about this for really as a property of invariance, something that I kind of want to keep. <laughs> Liveness are things that have to happen or should happen eventually. So it's not something that has to happen right now, but I do want to reach my destination, right? I don't, I don't want to, I never want to crash, but I do want to reach my destination. So the words reachability, reachable, you know, goals, those are all kind of uh, words that, that come into play. And depending on the type of formalism you use for specifications, and as you can tell, I'm advocating for using uh, specification formalisms, you can start talking about uh, conditionals. So if this happens, then this should happen. Uh, implications, uh, which is basically conditional and, and so on. So you can build up much more complex specifications that are really um, important when you're talking about autonomy, especially when you're talking around people and all that. And I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so uh, I cannot uh, uh, give a talk without having an LTL slide. So we will have an LTL slide uh, that uh, this is linear temporal logic. Um, it's, a, it's a modal logic that's evaluated over infinite executions. You do not have to follow this at all. Uh, probably if you've, you know, you either have seen this and, and are tired of this or you have not seen this ever and you don't know what I'm talking about, which is fine. The things you want to kind of keep in mind or, or, or uh, the take home of, of this slide is the blue. So safety, I can talk about, uh, uh, LTL lets me talk about always, things that always have to hold. Uh, liveness, I can talk about eventually, things have to happen at some point. Conditionals, kind of, well, you probably would use it more with the, with the implication uh, or with, with Boolean operators, but you can also think about until, this should happen until something else. Okay, so those are the things that you kind of keep in mind. I was looking, actually looking. So I, I, at some point, I think I gave, uh, in Ichikai 2019, I looked it up and there were, um, I think six papers in Ichikai uh, that, uh, that had the word LTL in them. Now I was looking at, uh, at the NURPS uh, and ICML this year. So there was one STL and one, uh, and there, there was one other thing in ICML, I can't remember what it was, but it, but it doesn't look like there's a lot of happening in the big ML uh, or anyway, based on titles, uh, but there's a lot, we're seeing a lot, starting to see a lot more uh, kind of temporal logic and machine learning and yeah, I'll get to that. But it's kind of cool to see. So it's very, very exciting. So different specification formalism. Let me just give a kind of a laundry list of things that we've looked at uh, in the past and, and I'll get to it, but definitely not just us. So many, there's a bunch of researchers, again, many on this, uh, um, on this Zoom call. Um, and the idea here is, uh, there are different variants of temporal logic. They all have their pros and cons in terms of complexity versus expressivity versus um, computation, kind of what can you compute with them? So we've been looking at different formalism, including SMT, so satisfiability modular theories. So it's, maybe it's not fair to call it a formalism, but the idea there is, again, 
really hand wavy Boolean formulas over predicate, over continuous predicates. So I can start thinking about saying things like, I always want the distance to be greater than, than uh, I, I always want, I want the distance between myself and the robot to be greater than one, but also smaller than two. So I want to maintain some, some diff distance. That's very easy to encode using SMT. That's kind of what we did in that uh, ICRA paper, kind of walking side by side. LTL, a lot of my work is, is, uh, has been has used LTL. All the examples that I showed before are using LTL. When you start talking about a, a probabilistic um, specifications or uh, or instead of, so linear LTL typically ha is very kind of yes, no. It's either satisfied or it's not. Uh, when you start talking about uh, MDPs and markup decision processes and, and uh, wanting to write specifications that have a probabilistic flavor, then you kind of go towards the more probabilistic uh, temporal logics, PCTL, PLTL, and so on. And then I think what, what I, I see my group moving more towards, and this is kind of, again, we're not the first to do this by any means, is uh, using uh, temporal logic that have some continuous aspect to them. So for example, signal temporal logic, uh, because then you can start talking about um, continuous uh, signals, such as time, such as distance, some things that are, make a lot of sense for robotics. Another type of, specific, of specification, um, which I have not mentioned till now, but definitely have to mention here, is, and I'm probably missing a few, um, the notion of reward function. So RL, right? How do we, it is also a notion of a specification. We, you have to specify what the desired behavior is through a reward function and everything builds on top of that. Now, there is some work on looking at reward functions plus, plus temporal logics to add more constraints, to add some, um, uh, more co complex temporal behavior. So there's kind of emerging work in that space, which is very exciting to see. So, so I, I don't want to separate them, but they typically were separated. Uh, and now I think people are starting to put them together, which is, which is exciting to see. And then when I talk about these specifications, kind of what, what kind of feedback can I get, right? So I'm actually going to start with the last bullet. Um, when we these specifications, especially when I talk about the temporal logics, um, they have, or especially LTL to be more precise, um, there's, they're always defined over abstractions. I don't really, I don't necessarily talk about a continuous signal associated with them. Talk about, um, let me break up the problem into these different Boolean um, propositions and let me kind of figure out what's going on or write specifications over these abstractions. Now, the connection between the abstraction and the temporal logic uh, and, and the specification, there, there's a clear connection there that allows us, especially when you talk about autonomy, when you talk about cyber physical systems, when you talk about robotics, um, gives us a richness of feedback that comes both from the combination of the abstraction and the specifications, which I think we, we're, um, it's very important to kind of take advantage of. All right, so as I mentioned, this is not a space in which uh, uh, my group is the only one, but nothing, uh, not even close. Uh, so this is, a, again, shameless plug number one, um, a survey that we wrote a while ago. So uh, Murteza Nahijanian is, um, did a lot of work kind of within the space, but he kind of uh, one of the first people to work really with the probabilistic uh, logics. Uh, Vasa Raman, one of the first to talk, to work with uh, STL, um, definitely uh, at her time at Berkeley. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of um, a lot of different specifications are kind of represented there. So let me go kind of in, in, in the you know, five minutes remaining, even less, I don't need to think I even need five. Uh, I want to just kind of the next challenge for me anyway, but I think I'm gonna advocate that a lot of, that people um, look at this kind of challenge. There's the word safety, and then there's the people who would use it. So the combination of those two words um, struck a, a chord with me because specifications are have to be tied to the people who use the autonomy, right? There's, I guess, okay, global safety, you don't want the system to crash, fine. But the, the interesting, the nuanced things come from what are the people who are gonna be working with it uh, gonna say. And there's a bunch of talks throughout the, the these two days that really touch on that, which I'm, Excited to, to wait, waiting to, to see. So going back to this, uh, uh, the example I had before, blue to the right, left, uh, red to the left. So this this is real time. So just to give you, a, uh, you know, this is slow. Um, 
but also it's kind of behaving in a slightly unexpected way, right? So it picked up the blue block. It's holding on to it. It's speaking of the red block, slowly. It's gonna go, it's gonna drop it in the bin, and only then it's gonna drop the blue block. Now this is perfectly correct behavior based on the specification. Whether this is correct behavior for someone who wants the robot to sort bins, that's a different question, right? If you, if you had stopped it now, we would say, okay, it forgot to drop the, blo the blue block, right? It's still gonna do it, but there's something about the interaction here. My expectation, we're looking at this video and what the robot is actually doing, but there's a mismatch. And that mismatch is something that can really hinder this kind of autonomy beyond you know, the fact that it's low and everything. So when I think about safety for human-robot interaction, HRI, and this is kind of a direction which I'm moving more into, um, great collaboration, great collaborators from the HRI community. What is this notion of safe, okay? Um, safety, what, what, is it, what is this notion of safe? And, and the, uh, a really, this most striking example I have is from Todd Murphy and, and Brenna Argyle at, uh, at Northwestern. Uh, they do a lot of work with the physical rehabilitation and there they have autonomy that is supposed to assist a, a, a person, but not over assist. Because if you over assist, you don't get this benefit of, 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 uh, of the therapy, right? So what is that? What is, how do we define that? What is failure? How do you think about failure in the context of HRI, right? Because the robot that you saw before didn't fail, did exactly the right thing. But if I was impatient and I saw that blue block and the arrow the whole time, I would consider that a failure. So what is that? How do, should I define that? How should I think about that in the context of HRI? And even more, uh, I don't know, more important, but also as important is this notion of um, specifying interaction. So not just what the autonomy wants, needs to do, not just modeling what the person is gonna do, but how does the interaction work, right? How do I talk about fluency? How do I talk about um, uh, timing of that, of turn-taking. There's a bunch of kind of questions of how to specify that. Because I think once we know how to specify, then we have the suite of, 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 uh, um, of diff different techniques that allow us to start doing verification and synthesis. But we have to reason about what that specification even is. So sh shameless plug number two, this is a paper that's gonna appear at the communications of the ACM um, sometime the next few months, I guess, it's accepted. But this came out of a doctoral workshop that we organized um, uh, me and Guy and, and uh, Kristen Eder, uh, me, Guy Hoffman, uh, Kristen Eder, and, and Rashid Alami, uh, on really these challenges of how do we formalize, how do we guarantee human robot interaction. And with that, um, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hadas. Um, do we have any uh, questions for Professor uh, uh, Kress Gazit? Please just unmute and ask. I, I, I might start off a, with a question, Hadas, mm -hmm. um, about, um, about formally updating the specification as the system is running in real time. And when you presented, I actually, I sort of thought about it throughout the kind of case studies you were presenting, but maybe most sort of strikingly at the beginning. Um, you know, how, how does one think about doing this in a way that, um, that sort of doesn't uh, back off from the formal guarantees that you want to make about the system. Um, I think this is really important as we think about uh, as you as your system is interacting with the environment, like in this last uh, discussion about HRI. How do we how do we update specifications um, while still maintaining sort of our safety and our, our our formalism that we'd like to maintain? That's an excellent question, right? So, so we've been looking. So, I had a student that, that did some work in that space, um, with mainly uh, uh, around the assumptions. So, when, whenever we write specifications, one of the things I like the most about, one of the things that that the specification, especially this kind of reactive synthesis, requires you, is to explicitly state assumptions about the environment. So, one thing that can happen. So, this is this is a half answer for you. Um, one thing that can happen is that your assumptions are violated as you're going. So we, we know we have runtime monitors, we have runtime verification, we can, we can monitor these things. And then we can see what we can do, right? One, one thing, the easiest, the, the most, the least satisfying thing is to say basically, oh, my assumptions are violated. 
can't do anything, no guarantees. Right, so that's not very satisfying. Uh, so the question is, can we robustify against assumption violation? So that's kind of one thing. The other thing is, um, kind of to your point, I think uh, as well is, um, if I had, if as I'm as I'm executing, I realize either the user realizes, well, I don't actually want to do this. I want to do something different, or I get conflicting uh, specifications as you're going, or the environment, and then I think, I I think we need to. We cannot hold on to the system will always be correct. Just can't, right? So not not for robotics, not for cyber physical systems. It's just the ability. The the, the um, I think uh, Kristen Eder from from Bristol. She I, I love her phrasing of this. It's increasing the trustworthiness. It's not guaranteeing that it will never fail because we cannot, mm -hmm. right? Or we can in a very, very limited, very specific under specific conditions, which is not as interesting. So feedback is something that I really believe in. So now if you're getting new specifications, can you figure out that there's something conflicting? Can you communicate that? Mm -hmm. if, there's a, if there's a conflict and you want, and, and is, there, is there some kind of basic level of things that you are never gonna violate? So maybe I, won't, maybe I will violate liveness, but I will never violate safety. Right. So there's a bunch of kind of, uh, um, different approaches to how to deal with these kinds of, of uh, uh, online changes, which I think are super exciting and kind of a, an area of research that we, that, the, but that formalizing specifications allow you to reason about it in a systematic way. So maybe yeah, not- I think, I think that's precisely the, the way we want to move forward. I agree with you a hundred percent. Yeah. Thank you.